an educational series on cyber security, compliance, and IT governance. Produced with the support of Freedom Technologies, Phoenix's leading managed service provider. With that, uh, let's jump into four. Do you want to give a quick breakdown on your, your bio and your current uh, role at your organization? Sure. Happy to, John. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been, uh, I think it was November last year uh, that I, I gave a talk uh, in person to the to the forum, and, and it's been a wild ride. Thank you. And, and uh, I wanted to also thank uh, some of the comments and, and notes I wrote down from that conversation is uh, Eileen was talking about the uh, recent advisory uh, about ransomware for uh, for healthcare, and thank you for bringing that up. I'll have a, a little bit about that in this presentation. Um, and uh, as Scott, you talked about negligence versus gross negligence, and uh, and I think that's really important for for this sort of practical cybersecurity uh, uh, focus. Is is you know sometimes that's that's all you can get, and um, and I've seen this where you're right that if the uh, the limit of liability in a contract is let's say a, a one month of of revenues or one month of fees or a year of fees for that matter, uh, gross negligence will bust that. Um, I've seen this happen. I've been expert witness in a number of cases uh, where that's really the, the goal of the opposition is to is to uh, show gross negligence, which opens, uh, which basically takes all of the indemnification um, out or a lot of it out. Um, so that's a that's a very important um, perspective to understand that that may sometimes our our main objective as cybersecurity professionals could be uh, just get to the to the realm of, of negligence or an, or an errors and emissions claim for insurance uh, rather than a claim of gross negligence, which can be a whole nother ball of wax. Um, let's see. Also, uh, Abel, I, I just wanted to give a shout out to, to you. You talked about role, uh, roles and responsibilities between IT and cyber, and, and you're as good as your, your IT counsel. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with IT teams. Uh, and partnering with them, and sometimes it's a it's a counseling effort, you know, just to to figure out what's practical, what they're capable of, and how to get them to move forward and raise the bar a little bit and reduce risk. Um, so I just want to say I appreciate those comments. Uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll jump into this. The uh, um, last year presented on uh, on the culture of cybersecurity and really fighting uh, APTs. And, and as I was thinking about uh, what to what to speak about. Uh, a year later, um, I still feel that this uh, this culture of cybersecurity is really the most important thing that we can do uh, in our organizations, and um, and and that pervades everything from the the organization itself in terms of your governance and your policies, uh, to your people, your process, your platforms, and even into your and it and it's represented in your data, including what you store and how you store it. Uh, and so this will be a, a bit of an update on some of the uh, uh, the stuff I talked about last time uh, with uh, new use cases um, and experiences from the last year. And um, uh, these are the, the use cases in here are personal experience and, and matters that I've had uh, firsthand knowledge of, um, except one. And that's a that's one that's actually, though, uh, impacting a lot of the, the client engagements uh, I'm involved with in, in right now, uh, just because of its, the ramifications legally. Uh, there's me, and you'll get my uh, my contact info. I'm sure from John, these slides will be made available. Um, ICE Cybersecurity, uh, we're a pure play cybersecurity company. Uh, we really focus on giving teams, um, helping IT and security teams make sense of all the data that's in their environment um, already. Uh, it could be your SIM tools, could be your firewalls, could also be your asset management systems, your uh, whatever whatever systems you may have. You've got security data laying all over the place. Uh, and we focus on bringing that all together into a, a cohesive risk story um, and really figuring out what is going to be the biggest bang for your buck to reduce risk. Um, you know, we, we often are giving clients uh, free and no cost uh, advice on things that can help them improve their organization uh, and then and work on those roadmaps of, of how are you going to march down the field and, and really um, teaching organizations that cybersecurity is a journey, not an event. You can purchase products, but you can't really purchase cybersecurity. You have to embody it as a culture uh, in every part of your organization if you're going to be truly effective. Um, about me, I've been doing this for 20 years, and uh, you can read the rest there. Uh, you can read my LinkedIn profile. Um, and uh, I guess a uh, fact there, I've, uh, I've been a professional drummer in my life uh, at one point. Made my made my living doing it. Uh, and now I cut my teeth and, uh, and I lead a, a team of, of folks that are a lot smarter than I am around cyber. 
Um, today, I'll I'll talk about some things that are that are technical. I'm not the most technical person in the world. I am a, I'm a recovering engineer, uh, turned CEO, and and uh, now I spend more time on business things than I do on uh, and, and dealing with boards and and for clients and dealing with some of the uh, the, the higher level governance issues. Um, and uh, and you, there's some folks on this call that will know a lot more uh, technical details than I. Uh, so please don't don't hesitate to throw a question out there or uh, or fill in the gaps uh, where I may leave some. All right. Uh, today, what we're going to do uh, the, the the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about um, where we were last year, 2019, what we thought was going to happen this year. Um, it certainly, it turned out a whole lot different than than what we. Uh, uh, than what actually than what we're experiencing right now. Uh, there's some things that have changed dramatically, and some things that haven't changed. Uh, good cybersecurity is still good cybersecurity, even in light of um, all the, the the chaos going on around us. Um, I've got some, like I said, case studies, and uh, really the 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 graphic on the right here is um, uh, I I'm going to try not to admire the problem. I'll try to to focus on best practices and takeaways that you can bring back into your into your lives tomorrow in your businesses and, uh, and make improvements. And uh, again, I welcome all questions and comments. Uh, you guys are a great group and I, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to be here and I, uh, I, I love the, the conversation that's been happening so far. All right. Um, there's, we don't have a formal poll up, uh, but if you guys wanna, uh, if you all wanna put a uh, comments in, um, I'd love to hear what you all think the most significant challenge you faced in 2020 uh, so far is. And uh, if you guys can, if, if you all can read it, or for those of you on the phone that might not be able to, the um, work from home, increase in ransomware, lack of resources, bring your own device, digital transformation uh, are the five choices I have. And if, you, uh, if you've got something else, throw it out there. Uh, we'll download the chat and I'll try to bring this uh, back to everybody as, as part of the, uh, the slides. All right. Thanks, everybody. Give that one more minute and then uh, just fire away as you, as you feel fit. All right. So a year ago, um, I was pulling some, some predictions around the internet and, uh, and from clients that I was working with, and they were saying that, that in 2020, um, the biggest predictions is an uptick in healthcare and government uh, hacks, ransomware, obviously, mobile, mobile threats, and the, the thought at that, at that point was the adoption of 5G was going to enable a whole new breed of threats uh, and vulnerabilities. Uh, and then thinking that AI was gonna play a big role in, in 2020 on, on both the, uh, the red and the blue team uh, end of things. Um, what, uh, what we saw in, in late 20, or in, in mid 2019, I want you to pay attention to this slide and, and look at what happened really with the uh, professional services slice of the pie. Uh, we saw software services, of course, healthcare, government, um, some pretty, uh, pretty obvious targets here. Uh, but watch this. A year later, professional services has has dominated. Uh, it's it's a 12% increase, which has packed down everybody else, um, you know, on the on the pie chart here. But really, to uh, to Scott uh, and Abel's comments uh, in their presentation about third parties, that's really who we're talking about here. We're talking about your accounting firms, your consulting firms, your services companies, your IT services companies. Uh, you know, John, not speaking poorly of MSPs, but uh, MSPs. So that would, uh, I, yeah, okay. Hey now. Sorry, go ahead. That is MSSPs too? So. Uh, yes, IT service providers and security service providers, absolutely. Sorry, John. It's all good. <laughs> and uh, if you guys didn't follow the uh, some of the news earlier this year about um, you know like your your RMM platforms, there were vulnerabilities were discovered uh, in in April and May um, after COVID was released when everybody went to work from home. It took about two months, uh, but the hackers caught on and they and they found those vulnerabilities and and there was a, a wave of those attacks that went uh, that went on through your RMM tools and there's still vulnerabilities out there if you haven't patched them. Uh, so this to me was was fairly significant, and if you do the math on this, just about everything else stayed proportionally the same. There were a few others that that increased uh, in here, but but really the big one is this professional services attack, 
and they understand that these, you know, your law firm, your accounting firm, you know, IT firms, these smaller shops that are your service providers, generally speaking, um, uh, just don't have the capability to be able to secure everything. And just like we saw in, in the target breach and, uh, and others, that third party can be the, that has access to your systems can be the easiest way in. All right, again, last year, I, uh, I was presenting, this was, there was a DevSecOps theme to the, uh, uh, to the presentation last year. And it was, you know, the idea that, uh, that security is left, left behind, left to clean up the, uh, the mess uh, from the, the DevOps and the digital transformation. Um, I think the, the idea is still, is still perva pervasive that, that we can fix it with a patch later once it's in production. Um, and that, uh, and this lack of trained cyber cybersecurity professionals is still a big, a big issue. Um, a year later, I mean, this is a well duh graphic here that um, obviously we have, we're living in new times right now. Um, and I don't know what, what you guys, uh, what all you, you experienced, but um, I saw this with many clients is that the uh, uh, overnight really, this is, I, I, it was March 16th in California when, uh, when we got the, uh, the go home order, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, um, there was IT teams that were sending people home uh, with, that had never worked from home before, never had the capability to do that. And it was all because of the governor's order here in California. Um, things that we've seen since then, depending on who you ask, um, it's a, we saw a hundred percent to 600% rise in ransomware attacks. Um, this middle comment here, I think is, is interesting, uh, because there was, I think, uh, uh, for those executives who hadn't paid attention to security before, um, they thought that because we're spending some money on it and because we, we, we thought about it, um, we already had security figured out and because they maybe hadn't been breached before. Um, and when you start talking about the new risks and what's going on, then all that security debt that goes along with the technical debt surfaces. And, and then the, the, uh, the other thing we're seeing out there is the increase in, in awareness and just because of the, the media coverage of breaches and of, of uh, security issues in this work from home environment, um, we've seen people just really rush to implement security or build security into their um, into their businesses. They've undertaken digital transformation projects at the, uh, 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 just at the drop of a hat. I mean, really that, that hadn't been in the works or maybe had been thought of. Um, they, we've seen organizations just reform their businesses and move to the cloud uh, just because of infrastructure challenges around this. Um, I'm being asked for some, uh, some links uh, to the attack numbers, yes, I will. Uh, I will include some of those in the uh, in the slides when I send them out. Thank you, Leo. And uh, and the, the other thing I would say in here is um, is we talked about lack of trained cybersecurity people. Um, what we've seen in the last year is that that the experience of having been in a breach or having been in an incident response um, that's the the practical experience. People have 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 gotten it, but but we need more people that have that. Um, you know, that, that year, six months to a year of practical experience of understanding what, what the traffic looks like out there. Um, that's probably one of the biggest gaps we're seeing right now. You, can, you might be able to read, a, read a, uh, a SIM dashboard or you might be able to look at a firewall, uh, but have you really been living it uh, long enough to really know what's important to secure? All right, and this one, as Eileen brought up, um, one of the big ones, we'll shift gears for, for a minute, and we'll talk about um, this latest. This came out last Wednesday evening. Uh, you may have seen it in the news. This imminent threat to healthcare, public health. Uh, Ryuk and Ryuk's rebranded um, brother, Conti. Uh, this, this is a, uh, it's been facelifted somewhat, um, according to some of the articles out there, so that this isn't your same, exactly the same Ryuk as, as before. Uh, and when we talked about TrickBot, and uh, some variants or other uh, other bot distribution networks, um, Bazaar Loader and Bazaar Backdoor as delivery mechanisms. So the um, Eileen, I thought it was very interesting your comments about uh, is this in response to Microsoft and and others 
um, combating the, the TrickBot uh, command and control networks, which has been largely unsuccessful. And, uh, and really it's, it has to, and I see this as a, um, I hate to say it, but it, they're, they're being entrepreneurial in the way that they're evolving the ransomware and, and, uh, and adding features and adding ease of use and adding capabilities um, to, to really overcome whatever defenses we're putting in place. Uh, this slide talks about five hospitals were hit last week at the, on Wednesday. Um, Eileen talked about uh, 16, I believe, that she's aware of as of today. So this is clearly clearly happening. Um, and the uh, the motivations and impacts that we're seeing out there. The uh, this is this is big ransomware. This isn't you know three or five hundred bucks. This is 10 million plus uh, ransom requests to these organizations. Um, it's designing, it's creating time pressure, uh, and it's got a data exfiltration element to it in many cases, where not only is it uh, uh, getting you to, to pay the ransom, but it's saying if you don't, we'll just we'll expose your data on the internet and create a secondary breach. So even though this is this would be reportable for a healthcare organization under HIPAA, uh, this can can create much bigger issues uh, just because of that that exfiltration uh, piece, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, the, uh, and I don't know if anybody saw this in the, in the news in the last, uh, last month, but in September, the first death related to ransomware was reported in Germany. And this was a patient um, that was being uh, taken to the emergency room on a critical uh, health issue. And they were diverted because uh, the, the emergency room was, was shut down due to ransomware. And they, they had to go to another town. And in that process of being transported to another town, uh, the patient died. Uh, there's a suspect that, that there were some ransomware deaths uh, or deaths related to ransomware in the, uh, I believe it was what, 2016, 2017 uh, National Health Service shutdown uh, in the UK. Uh, not, I haven't found any confirmed articles on that. You guys may have some, but this one was confirmed in Germany in September. Hey, Ford, just a quick right. note on that. Yep. Uh, so on the German Germany uh, event, uh, the woman was diverted to and the delay caused her death because of her condition, what have you. And the um, uh, ransomware individuals basically did not even realize that they hit a hospital. That wasn't their target. And once they, in whatever mechanism they were communicating, they were advised that they had hit the hospital they then provided the decryption keys and they tried to basically shut down and you know, disconnect from the situation. Uh, but the key there is that the tar you're not always the target. You can be you know, collateral damage and it's, it's spray and pray to a lot of these ransomware things. So, and the, the ransomware people, they, they know they're, they have some abstraction or anonymity, but it, they were afraid of the, the legal or other fallout associated with that, which was interesting. That is interesting. Thank you. Um, and, and you're right. And, and that reminds me of uh, early in the year, um, in the beginning of COVID, they were talking about, uh, there were some reports from some of the hacker groups that said they weren't going to, to target uh, COVID treatment centers and hospitals uh, just for public health reasons. And um, I'm not sure if we, on this one, if we, if, if I read that there was confirmed the communication from them, um, that they were now lifting that sort of moratorium on, on healthcare or that this is uh, reports from the, uh, uh, the CISA. But it, it, this is clearly going after healthcare right now in a time when, when we arguably can't do without any healthcare, uh, any reduction in capacity. You're right, John, I wish there was some honor among thieves, right? All right, so uh, I, I can, there's uh, this is where we can get beyond my, uh, my technical depth pretty quickly, uh, but I wanted to have this in, in here so you guys could look at it and go back to Sophos Labs. There's a really good write up on exactly how, uh, how a TrickBot and Ryu works. Um, some things to understand here is that the, uh, this, the initial compromises seem to come from spear phishing attacks almost exclusively. Um, they install the, the botnet and then there is a, uh, di they disable command line logging um, on the host that they, uh, that they come after. Um, they 
download the payloads. They also disable antivirus, um, move laterally and harvest credentials uh, from the network, gain access to a domain controller, uh, and then distribute uh, more uh, more co uh, comprehensively. And when they go to uh, to execute, uh, they do they go after backups as a primary target, or they uh, or they remove the backups, uh, exfiltrate data, and encrypt. Um, the one of the write ups we've seen on this uh, said that there's the, the the shocking thing about this is the speed with which these attacks are happening. Um, so I read some uh, some research that said it was uh, they, they noticed three and a half hours from the time of the spear phishing attack um, to when they're conducting reconnaissance on the network to gain gain privilege uh, elevation and uh, 24 hours from the from that uh, initial email attack uh, to gain access to a domain controller. And then targeting backups first. I mean, we kind of knew this already that that ransomware was was wired that way. Uh, but these the, there's some some confirmation as part of this the right and uh, the right vector. Uh, the backups are either being are being disabled first off, um, and then being any backup servers. If you have a, a server backup server 01, you know, as the name of a server, that's a pretty obvious one. Uh, here's a uh, a Ryuk use case that I've been personally involved in. Um, share some, and this was earlier this year, uh, prior to this iteration. Uh, but there's some some similarities, and we can just show you what happens um, and what can happen, uh, and how fast this can actually work. Um, so this is this is clearly big game hunting. You know, they're really going after uh, ransoms that pay an awful lot of money. I mean, this was a uh, you know, one of those $10 million plus uh, ransom uh, situations. I use the, uh, the franchise in air quotes because uh, we're in California and franchise laws are, are such that if you call your business a franchise, you pay a lot more in taxes. So this is a distributed operating model, um, operated a lot like a franchise though. The, uh, there were some, some shared corporate services, so accounting, legal, uh, some other things that you would expect, some IT. Um, but really, not a, uh, cybersecurity was not one of those shared services, and it really was sort of an old school approach, uh, which was you know you get your uh, you get a cable modem, uh, you have a, a couple of computers at your at your point of sale, and uh, good luck. Hopefully, hope for the best. Um, we talked uh, earlier, uh, Scott and Abel were talking about third party reviews. There was certainly none of that going on here, uh, and this is a very large organization. Um, I mean, or you call it two billion in revenue. I call that pretty large. Uh, and and when it was hit, they were going through M and A transactions. So this was not the uh, they, so they picked you know probably the most opportune time to do this. Anytime I can slip Chevy Chase into a presentation, it makes me happy. Uh, and so this is this is one where they clearly knew what the insurance limits were of the organization, meaning they had been inside, they understood, they they. They, they got access to confidential information and they, they spent a lot of time reconning the organization. Um, if anybody recalls this scene from vacation, uh, Chevy Chase says, how much is gonna cost me? And they say, how much you got? Um, and so this is the way this actually executed was a uh, one of these franchise uh, organizations that had an email account uh, clicked on an email, really simple. Um, and then it spread like wildfire uh, to globally shut down the entire organization for over a week. Um, and then there were boomerang infections that were still occurring uh, 10 to 12 months later. So this is one where, you know, without that culture of cybersecurity, without that centralized IT and, and security services that was able to go um, uh, put standard, standard practices in place, standard technologies, be able to centrally fight fires, um, without the, pre the preparation that you needed it in order to, to be ready when it hit. Um, this is one of those, the, the, the gift is, is still giving uh, for this organization. And they, like I said, they paid a uh, $10 million ransom uh, with the help of their insurance company. Um, the insurance company is probably gonna want some, if not all of that money back. Um, because if you read your, your policy and what's, what your exclusions are in those policies, uh, th this is again where uh, Scott's comments on negligence versus gross negligence can come in 
Um, I've, I've, I've been in these cases where it's insurance company versus insurance company. And with gross negligence, um, you know, you are likely your insurance company uh, can has recourse against you and says you, um, you either lied on your policy or application or you tripped an exclusion and you owe them the money back. Um, so we haven't seen exactly what's going to happen in this case yet, but uh, you can bet that in the next year, uh, the insurance company is going to want their pound out of this. And then there was other real costs uh, in terms of, of remediation and cleanup outside of the insurance that cost this organization uh, over $3 million, at least in the first uh, six, uh, six months. And it's still ranked, uh, still going. Ford, I got a question. Yep. You called it a $2 billion company. Is that gross revenues or is that valuation? Gross revenues. Yeah, so 10 million's a drop in the bucket to those guys. They're probably considering that as part of their risk profile. Yeah, it wasn't, uh, and their margins are not very, very, very big, but you're right. It's probably a drop in the bucket to them. The, the interesting thing is that it was a $10 million limit on their, their cyber liability policy. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> yep. Very convenient, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so we're seeing this with, uh, I've got some, uh, we, we did an insurance presentation to the, uh, uh, to, to a group of attorneys last week. Uh, you want to talk about e-honor? No, it was, uh, uh, but that was some of the, the things that the insurance companies are seeing is that the ransom requests are coming at or just under their limit uh, in the, their policy limits, meaning the attackers have intelligence. They're in the systems, they're infiltrated well before they do great, re great recon and know what they can ask for. All right. Uh, in this one, the, uh, the, the key, the key thing I think for this organization was um, the, the, fourth bullet here is understand not just what their limit of liability was and, and where they were in their contracts, but what is their risk as an organization? And so this is a, this happened in a, um, in a, uh, in a time when they were under acquisition um, and it, and it just created a great deal of delay and, and confusion inside that M&A activity. Uh, so, you know, the, the idea of paying as little as possible and, 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 uh, and thinking that you have contract li uh, liability, contract limits, indemnification, and insurance, and that's going to cover you. Um, that came up and bit this organization uh, pretty hard. And the other thing is, is at the end of this is, um, you know, we talked about good IT and, and being as weak as your as your uh, strongest IT person. This is again one where good good firewalls, good network design, segmentation um, could have really helped uh, this organization. It may not have. But it, but it certainly would have given them a fighting chance um, to stop some of the boomerang effects and to stop it from spreading from one remote location back to HQ, then out to all the other remote locations. From a network professional, thank you. <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm a recovering network guy myself. We talk about micro segmentation quite a bit uh, to prevent ransomware in service provider environments. And that's something I think is poorly understood and needs, and uh, I wish people would go back and understand proper subnetting um, just a little bit more. All right, so what's the payoff? We talked about 10 million. Um, this is an example of, of a, a ransomware campaign. Uh, and what, shot, what stands out to me in here is that 2.9% of the, of the ransoms that were paid uh, equated to 9,500 people and $34 million. Um, for this annual, the annualization, annualized revenue in this campaign. This is from Cisco. Uh, you got to do some some assumptions in the math if you want to reverse engineer these numbers. Um, but this is clearly big business. Uh, the and I don't know if anybody saw that in 2018 there was a study came out that uh, that said uh, cyber crime is more profitable than illegal drugs. So hacking is more profitable than drugs. All right, so here's some real world data uh, from a client using a, uh, uh, there's a, a company we, we like called Risk Analytics. Um, this is Insight is the name of the, the company, Risk Analytics is the name of the, uh, of the product. 
and these uh, these are outbound blocks. And so this company, what, what this comes from is a device that sits outside the firewall. So these are things that get in, that execute, they get in through email, they get in through other things. Um, and then these are uh, the last line of defense. Uh, sometimes we install these, uh, these layer two shunt devices that takes a threat feed, looks for any known bad IP addresses or domains, and then blocks them inbound or outbound. Uh, and so you see, this is a uh, uh, these are the the normal actors you would you would expect. So how do they get in? Uh, this you, depends on who you look at. This uh, the CISO online and the and this is a 2019 Verizon DBR number. Um, I don't have the numbers from 2020, even though it's out already. Um, I'm, I'm going to call myself a slacker for not having having updated updated this one, but. Um, a shockingly, the majority, I mean, almost all of the uh, malware comes in through email. Um, and, and I think, I think that's what we all would expect and, and, and have seen. And spear phishing. And so the, um, this, this pie chart here tells me, and, and the, some of the data behind the data here, is that the, uh, the direct email phishing compromises are one, but then lateral movement through RDP uh, is another one. And I see uh, Richard talking about RDP still. Yes, RDP. And if you go back and look at that Sophos article that uh, uh, about the Ryuk ransomware, it's RDP. Uh, it's uh, and the, it's the primary vector to move laterally within within the environment. And if your IT systems management tools use RDP as the way to go do remote sessions inside your network, that's also how the bad guys will spread within your network. Um, and a note on RDP. We've seen for the first time that insurance companies uh, are scanning networks. So when you file your, your cyber liability policy application, uh, we've seen underwriters now who have tools that they will run vulnerability scans in your network and enumerate your network, uh, the, at least the public IP space. And we've seen one case, at least in one of our clients, that uh, a major insurance provider, because they had a remote desktop gateway exposed to the internet, which again, this is that IT counseling thing, um, they declined to, uh, they refused to insure that, that company. Uh, they found another insurance carrier that would do it. Uh, but this is the first time, to my knowledge, that, that an insurance company is actively scanning and looking for vulnerabilities because they're tired of paying ransomware. All right. Ford? So we talked last year. Yep. Quick note on that. So we use actually Cowbell is a cyber insurance company. Um, they do that and we use them for cyber insurance and as a managed service provider basically they let us uh, type in any company's name in their uh, 1.4 million uh, client portfolio and basically see their risk score so we have contracts in in line with them so that we don't abuse that but it's a it's it's a very scary power to have as a managed service provider that has a relationship with a cyber with a cyber insurance company that does just what you say, and it, it I think that's the trend in the way things are going. They're going to incorporate your public risk score that's derived from your uh, a combination of factors done in Bradstreet, your uh, external scan, what's in the dark web, all those things tie into your Cowbell report. Interesting. You know, I, I ran into a group at, uh, at RSA, um, and that was the, the last public event that I went to as, as COVID had just been announced. Um, and it, I think they're called Risk Score. Um, I think that's just what the name of the business is. I'll have to go look it up and I'll see if I can send it to the group. Uh, but you can sign up for them and they, they will do a, a, a sort of a public um, risk, uh, like, like what it says, a risk score. And you can sign up for their service and it's like a Dun & Bradstreet, you know, kind of a, a risk scoring uh, service. So I, I agree with you, John. I think that's that's coming soon. And we've seen this. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, so of, yeah, go ahead. Risk Score is another company, as you said, they're out in New Mexico. And uh, they basically ingest Tenable or Qualys logs. And they identify, here's all the vulnerabilities you have. And they match it up with what is actively being exploited. So they help you prioritize your vulnerabilities about which ones you should should approach first from a practical standpoint and tie in a lot of other metadata too but yeah 
Very cool. I didn't know that that's how they were doing it on the back end, but I did know they were selling their data to uh, insurance companies and to other uh, third parties. So if you're, you know, you want to vet somebody you're, you're doing business with, that's kind of the, one of the premises behind their business models. Very interesting. This is going to move in the next, uh, in the next year or two uh, quite rapidly because the insurance companies are moving from a, um, a cost-based model to a risk-based model. Uh, where theoretically you could get lower premiums, well, don't hold your breath, uh, if you're if you have better cyber hygiene. All right. So we talked about uh, uh, this is again from last time is about the way security used to be. Um, anytime I can put a sloth on a on a deck, it makes me smile as well. Um, but really, I think the the key of this is that. Um, the unpredictability of security, I think, scares people. And, and what we say to people, you never know. You know, I always look at boards and, and get invited to speak with the board of directors. And everybody kind of looks at me like afraid of what I'm going to say that's going to be on the record or, or put into the minutes. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, it's incumbent upon all of us to be able to forecast, to be able to use, um, uh, use frameworks and use language that's accessible and, and consistent and understand who we're speaking with and what liabilities we can create when we start trying to scare people into taking action. You know, it used to be, uh, you know, the felt like the crazy guy in the corner, you know, making loud noises, trying to get people to pay attention to me. Um, and I think it's shifting, uh, at least in the, in the clients that I'm working with, that it's, uh, 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 and that they're starting to take notice. And so when they do that, you got to maintain your professionalism and, and keep your, uh, uh, you know, and, and create that predictable, consistent communication. It doesn't freak out the non-cyber people, but still get your point across and get your, uh, and, and gets them to take action. All right, uh, with that, we'll go to another, uh, another use case. And this one is, uh, uh, again, an organization, uh, some personal experience here. Uh, this is an organization that, that is, uh, you wouldn't think of as being innovative, but I want to call them out as doing it right. Um, they have, this is a construction services company, thousands of, or commercial real estate, sorry, company, thousands of applications, um, almost 100,000 employees uh, globally, and, uh, and they're everywhere. And so they, they've really adopted technology quite a bit, um, or extensively in, to enable their business. And so these guys, what they did um, that I, I really want to call out here is that they uh, they embodied security and they and they created this this mission to go completely overhaul their custom applications. And this uh, the second bullet here about 50 apps in 50 weeks with 50 teams. They embedded security people and auditors on every single one of those teams. So they and and they spent years doing this, uh, the planning of it to execute on it, um, and they've done it successfully. And so now, quick question. Jeff Sekos. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So when you say rewrite, um, I'm really curious what language, what platform, did they use different methodologies, different project management, like what exactly, because just doing it the same as before isn't going to buy you much. So did they have any specific goals in terms of the rewrites? Yes. And they use uh, just about every language that you can, you can think of out there and they're, and they're cross platforms. Um, and really what they did is they, they hired some DevOps, uh, real DevOps gurus that, that were able to, to create their CICD pipelines, re-architect it from scratch, um, and from a process perspective first, and then start feeding requirements and then, and then uplifting code. Uh, and this is, a, this is a massive undertaking you know, across all areas of expertise. Uh, and they used some, any, some new... Do you have any background on that that you could share? Not, like, it would take too long right now, but I have lots of questions. I would love to use that as an example in terms of exactly what they set up for CI, CD, different types of static dynamic analysis. Like if that's publicly available, I would love to see that if you, if you could share at some point. Let me see what's publicly available. I'm happy to share that. Who's, uh, who's speaking? Uh, this is Alio. Alio. So we're, I'm actually yeah, working on a, all today, a project that touches on this stuff. So really curious to have some more, besides what I've already found, some more stories out there to be able to back with actual case studies. So that would be much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and I can bring in uh, also my my CTO into the conversation, who is uh, is far more versed on the uh, the, de the actual DevOps tools and processes than than I. Um, I can pay at lip service, but he lives it every single day, 
um, as a as a, as a developer, long time de developer uh, running dev team. So um, that may be a more useful conversation. We can take that offline for sure. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. You got it. Um, you know the the outcome of this uh, for this organization, and I was speaking to a, an, the auditor um, when I was uh, learning about this project and, and working with their audit teams. Is they were very very proud that the auditors had started speaking the language of DevOps. And I thought I looked at her and I said, "You kind of you, you don't talk like an auditor." And uh, and they really retooled their entire team uh, and taught them about the technology and and how to integrate, and so they can speak the language of the developers. Um, and, and really build this, build these CICD pipelines that really truly work, um, not just the, the kind of lip service that you would, you would expect and you would hear, you know, we, we talk about, we talk to people all the time that say, yeah, I got CICD automation, we got this, we got this, we build this in, we build this in, and then you start getting under the covers and they've implemented it maybe halfway or they really don't understand it or they're still doing the same thing they were doing to Ilio's point um, and they're, they've just, you know, given it a, a fresh new buzzword you know, in front of whatever, of everything that they were doing. Uh, and these guys really embodied it and overhauled their entire team from, from people process platform uh, perspective. And it took them years, uh, but now they're moving very fast. Uh, they've enabled um, everything and they've got this, you know, as a construction, as a, as a commercial real estate company, you wouldn't think of them being as technically uh, proficient and, and innovative as they are, but really they see themselves as a technology company now. That's, uh, that's pretty impressive. I think that's a, a an example of how it should be done. All right, and some of the things um, I, I started asking about how they, um, as I was working with them, how they really, how they did it and where they went into this. And so they start building this idea of this process, but you can't just, you know, top down its force and say, all right, everybody, here's, we're gonna do it this way now. And, uh, and you know, cause you kind of stop things and then you gain, you get resistance because you just move everybody's cheese um, immediately. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't work that way. So the, the places where they picked in the life cycle, to start, uh, life cycle to start picking their fights was really in the testing. So could they start running some static code and dynamic code analysis on their way into the release stage? Um, creating that stage gate process and figuring out good tools that fit into, into what they were doing. Um, Understanding the operational phase now also, this is vulnerability scanning, this is log analysis. So could they take and work with the IT teams and really take running applications and now look for vulnerabilities that created evidence that they could build into the next life cycle phases and saying, all right, can we close these vulnerabilities on the next iteration? Um, again, operationalizing um, how they dealt with, with scaling and how they dealt with some of the, uh, the, the core IT processes um, that, that ran their stacks. Um, and then they took all of that and started building it into the plan. And as they got into that and they had testing capability so that they weren't holding things up on the way out the door, um, and they were able to then have good empirical evidence from their, their production applications, then they were able to feed this all into the entire life cycle and start gaining traction. But again, they planned this whole thing out a long time ahead and then they picked their spots to start implementing. Uh, Ford, this is Leo. Uh, quick question. When I'm looking at the diagram, I always find it interesting that the planning stage on this diagram looks to be the shortest piece, and yet I have a feeling it's longer than most of the other most of the other sections. Yeah, I, I, I would say this is uh, uh, this is not to scale. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Not. I, I was going to say usually planning the first planning stage, and you're talking about they plan for a long time based on what I'm looking at the actual screen, that looks like a real short time compared to what I would normally expect to see. I just started to throw that out. Yeah, I appreciate that. And the, and the, uh, the planning I'm referring to is the overall process here, the entire diagram right. is making that organizational commitment and planning that change, that organizational change management. And then the individual planning into the, into the development cycles, uh, that's, that's sort of what's, what's represented here. And then there's some, you know, iterative stuff in here that's not really, uh, that I don't think, you know, you would put some feedback loops in here and in some other places to make it realistic. Uh, but, but yeah, you're right. That, that planning part is, um, that, I, I tell you what, that's probably the biggest challenge I'm seeing out there in, in companies right now is I'm bringing security to the table still a little bit late, um, thinking that we're not, we're gonna, we're gonna slow things down and they're afraid to bring us in. 
question for you, Ford. Yep. So, you know, you indicated that the static code analysis happened in test. Why, why wasn't it moved back to the pre-build stage where you could really do static code analysis and make your changes before you build and, and find, those, find those gaps before you, you get into a build test fix uh, scenario? That's a very astute observation, and and the the w the way they did it was to um, they gained re they got resistance as they were going into the build and trying to um, to monkey with that build process. So they were able to insert themselves into the test phase, and because they hadn't fully automated the the life cycle and they didn't they you know they weren't rolling out a change a week or a, a uh, or a release every day. You know, like a lot of organizations are doing these days. Um, that's where they picked their first fight. And, you know, ideally you're, you're, you're bringing security tooling and testing into the entire life cycle and at just about every stage. Uh, but that's where they, they, they started was, was they said, all right, let's just, let's just go between test and, and, and release and let's see if we can do it. And if they came up with something that, and they had the organizational commitment that said, if they came up with a serious flaw that they were going to stop release. Yeah, that just gets expensive. It does, and you know they could they could afford it, and they were still moving pretty slow when they when they started doing this. Um, so again, that was the that was the the beachhead that they were able to go get gain traction, you know, with the team. I agree with you. Thanks. Yeah, and that's uh, you know I'm glad you brought that up because that's a um, that's part of the practical, I think, journey here. Is that uh, you, you know you, you want it to, to happen in in coding and in building so you understand so you, so you catch it really early, but in this case, culturally they couldn't get that done. So you get done what you can and you continually improve and you continue to show value. And what they were doing was was trying to embed themselves in the team and show value in the team, and that's how they how they were able to do it in their use case. All right. So that was uh, to that last point. That that's sort of the the how they built the culture of cybersecurity. They were able to break down that silo between dev, uh, security, and operations through that that initial toehold, um, and start adding value throughout the cycle. Uh, and then they were finally able to to then affect the the, the, the culture change in the end, and it paid off. And this is what we're seeing with our clients, where we're we've been in for a long time, and we're and the most successful ones that we see. Uh, is that from the boardroom, uh, you know, I like to say from the boardroom down to the server room, uh, we, we, we create that embodiment of that, of that cybersecurity culture where, you know, people wouldn't do anything without cybersecurity being, being part of the, the conversation. And, and every contract that comes through has a, has a cyber review. Every technology that goes out, every move that's made um, has cyber as part of it, which, you know, causes us to, to become a, a, a very high service organization. Otherwise they're going to, you know, that, that's going to wear off. Mm -hmm. You guys are getting some funny comments here. I love it, man. You guys are a fantastic, fantastic group. All right. Uh, so uh, we can blast through. We got just a few minutes left here. Um, <coughs> This is kind of the way it was. Uh, the, what I presented last uh, last time. Some things that have changed that, that throw things into the mix are are really, you know, work from home, bring your own device, and the speed at which this is all happening. Um, so I think the the adaptive risk conversation is really important, not just to rely on the frameworks as they were, but understand practically what's going on out there and how you can best service your organization. <laughs> Uh, and here's one I, I want to share, and, I, and if we don't get to the final, uh, to all of the, the use cases, that's fine. The, uh, I'll flip through it, and uh, you guys can see the, the, the I'll, we'll send out the whole deck so you can have it. Um, this particular use case was a hospital system that sent everybody home in, uh, in March. Um, the IT team deployed lots of systems um, on the fly just to get people home so they could continue to support their hospital and continue to serve patients. Uh, these these home, these workers were at home for three months on their their home networks, um, and then they came back in in late June is when they uh, they were allowed to come back into the office. And here again from that uh, risk analytics uh, product and from Insight uh, that we use, this is active malware 
you can tell when they started coming back into the office and they picked it up at home and was it, did they wait until they saw the, the, the corporate network or did they, or was it sending data out all the time prior to that? But these were, this is the, the, the traffic pattern that happened um, immediately. It just shows the infections. This, this did not exist prior to COVID and prior to people going home. Uh, but it did, but it happened sometime between the time when they went home and the time when they came back to work. So this, I thought this was, this was just poignant in its, in its illustration of, of the risks that we're facing here um, in the way that we're working today. For sure. All right. So the questions that, that come up out of this is, is, did the IT team do the right thing? Um, getting people to work from home and just and getting them home quick and maybe not uh, not not having the time to vet everything um, on the way out. Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think from a security practitioner perspective, I would have liked to see a lot more testing, uh, a lot more hardening of systems and some other other technological issues. This is clearly a, uh, a business continuity uh, issue for these organizations, and they really did the best they they could with what they had and, and their their level of preparedness. Um, I think the 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 things that we were learning and we're teaching organizations is part of this, um, and this is all work in progress, right? I mean, I think you all know, and probably you all are. are I would love your your feedback and opinions on this um, and lessons learned because this is the, you know we're making this up as we go. A lot of it, um, you can see here the the, the testing. Um, the, some of the tough stuff that we're seeing out there uh, is, is people still have local admins um, on their machines. And it's, is it technological reasons why you have to be a local admin or is it laziness or is it you don't have the, the pull in the organization to stop them or you don't have the resources? I don't know, uh, but we still see a lot of that and that helps, helps the bad guys quite a bit. Um, you know, we, we're still seeing a lot of old old systems. I mean, I just, and I don't want to say Windows 7 because I don't see a lot of that, but we still see some stuff that can't be managed well. Uh, and we see, uh, we see a lot of software out there that has known vulnerabilities that's, that's still deployed and, and, and either can't be patched or it's out there without um, enough resources from IT to get the, get the patching done. Um, I put in here split tunneling because um, I don't know if you all have experienced this in your businesses or, or, or have heard about this with your clients where um, uh, a lot of split tunneling is going on right now just because of the bandwidth needs. You can't push it all back through a firewall. Um, and we're seeing organizations upgrade to gig, 10 gig internet connections um, just so they can start handling and inspecting the traffic uh, that's going from all their endpoints and try to and try to deal with it all. But you know, those things can, sometimes you have to pull fiber, sometimes you, you don't have the infrastructure, um, you need to upgrade hardware and that can take some time. So thinking about that. And then uh, we talked about RMM. Um, a lot of these organizations found out their RMM tools were flawed or they didn't work when they got outside the, the firewall. Uh, if anyone's deal, dealt with uh, Active Directory versus uh, Azure AD connected machines and using Intune and, and some of the Microsoft stack to manage systems, it's, it sounds easy on the Microsoft website, but it is not simple. Um, and then I think somebody earlier talked about business continuity incident response. Uh, I think everybody we talked to and, and we know had a pandemic clause in their, in their IR plan on their business continuity plan, but nobody got it right. This is, this, this happened in a, in a much different way than anybody anticipated. And since the invention of the internet, um, and the modern ways of doing IT, there's been nothing, uh, like it that we can fall back on to, for relevant experience where we are writing this book as we go. All right. Um, I'll, uh, out, of, out of respect for time here, we've got uh, five minutes left. Uh, I'll, I'll take any other questions. A um, couple other things to, to mention here, though, are, are uh, the OFAC advisory. Um, John, have you talked about that at all in this um, uh, at Southwest Cybersecurity Forum? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Okay, so if you haven't, uh, that's one recent. Um, uh, notice that came out, I want to say it was the beginning of October, uh, was the Office of Foreign Asset Control put out as a Department of Treasury put out an advisory that said anyone that was uh, that, that made a ransomware payment or facilitated a ransomware payment to a known bad actor or somebody on the Treasury Department's naughty list, um, that the Treasury Department would prosecute 
uh, fines and or, or uh, potential civil or criminal prosecution. So something everybody here should know. And that changed my business immediately um, in that we're no longer going to facilitate ransomware payments for any of our clients if something happens. We've done it in the past. We've negotiated successfully to get keys, uh, to get people's data back. Uh, but I don't look good in orange, and so we're just not going to do it until there's a uh, enough case law to show that I, that I could be safe and won't go to jail. How does that play into the cybersecurity realm, or the, the insurance? Uh, interesting. I don't know. Um, I haven't heard anything from insurance uh, providers directly yet. And generally, they have people, that, uh, outside firms, that do that negotiation for them. But they're clearly targeting our industry. As, as cybersecurity professionals. I would think that the insurance company wouldn't have liability in that because they're basically paying you back for an expense that you made to make the payment. So you are on the hook for the legal violation and, and the insurance is just covering an expense. Yeah, but at that point, what, what use of cyber insurance if I'm going to get thrown in jail for using it? That's a conversation between you and the government. The insurance company is just providing a service. <laughs> you know, I've been involved in, in some policies in, in, in a couple of cases where the insurance company actually made the payment to the, uh, to the criminals. They had uh, uh, either one of their employees or, or a contractor. It was hard for me to tell who they, who they worked for exactly, but, um, but they made the payment and they were actually, uh, Really, they kind of put a war room situation together and they confiscated a lot of people's uh, devices because they wanted to make sure it wasn't an inside job, you know, where somebody was in, the, in the company was getting paid the actual ransom. And they really were very careful about how they did it. And it was in Bitcoin. And uh, I personally believe that the insurance company bought low and sold high uh, and made a profit on the whole thing. But um, I have no evidence to back that claim up. Um, so I, I, again, I don't know how that's going to change future ransomware incidents. I think we're going to start seeing some of that come out here. And if Treasury starts charging people under OFAC, that's going to be a, a big deal. All right, I could keep going, but uh, I know everybody. It's 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 the end of the the top of the hour here. It's been a long night. Um, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. And I'll send out the, we'll, we'll work with John to get the slides out to everybody. Thanks, Ford. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ford. Thank you. And uh, so we'll probably end here shortly. Just a quick note that uh, there was a, a news item I wanted to bring up. Uh, I don't know how many people here knew, were aware that uh, NSS Labs actually shut their doors about 14 days ago. And uh, there was, uh, various factors that are kind of being played in the news. One of them is COVID, but some things I've read that they were acquired or accepted uh, um, part of the acquisition to a, um, a group that wasn't, was mainly focused on profit and for whatever reason, they weren't able to maintain their business operations. So uh, it's unfortunate because they're basically play, have historically played a, lar a strong role in evaluating firewalls for example, and uh, doing bake-offs and, and similar to, to Gartner. So they are no longer in existence. So there's a lot of talent there, there that's uh, leaving and finding other jobs, but that's definitely a hole, I think, in the industry. Ford, did you hear about that at all? No, I didn't. Yeah, just 14 days ago. So Interesting. Yeah, just a tidbit there. So there's still all kinds of fallout still happening. Just we're in a chaotic time in cyber and you, you can be good at what you do, but you still have to be cost competitive and be able to make a profit. Otherwise it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, I think we're gonna see that, uh, see a lot of shake up here over the next uh, the next couple of years in this space. There's an act, there's a consolidation going on right now. There's a huge push a huge amount of capital going into uh, cybersecurity companies. And unfortunately, I'm seeing companies go after each other uh, rather than just going after the bad guys. Um, right. You know, driven by competitive forces in, in Silicon Valley. Yep. 
Awesome. Well, um, we can keep it open if people want to chat, but uh, I'll probably uh, tie a bow on it for myself. Um, thank you, everybody. Another great meeting, and uh, we'll work to get this posted. Again, we're moving some of the conversation over to Keybase. But uh, that's not going to detract from the emails. They're still going to be the primary mechanism for communication. So um, that's all you need to monitor. But if you want to have a deeper conversation with some of the other members of the group, that Keybase channel is open and people are joining. So um, perfect. Ford, thanks again. John, thank you. Will you get my contact information out to the to the group? I'm uh, I'm happy to to answer any more questions offline or, or talk to anybody uh, that wants to follow up. Cool. I will. And a quick, quick note, one of the reasons I wanted to invite you is last year, I did not get to record your presentation and I thought it was excellent. Uh, basically how an organization adopted security at every level in its development cycle and it had a bottom line positive impact to their operations and their competitive stance. And I thought it was a testimony to how a lot of companies should kind of relook at how they're incorporating cybersecurity into their business operations. So. Thank you, John. All right. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.